This story is about a teenage hustler from the Bronx who made millions of dollars on the streets before he could legally drink alcohol. At the end, 31 members of his organization would be arrested and most of them would decide to cooperate against him. His ambition would ruin his life and the lives of those who hustled with him. This is the story of Boy George Rivera, the teenage millionaire kingpin. Born around 1968, George grew up in the Bronx. Before his first birthday, his father would leave the unstable family life, which often included George moving around to different locations within New York. In those days, this area was populated with a mixture of cultures and people that emigrated from many other countries, including Puerto Rico. In the 1970s, the Bronx had an economic collapse, and combined with an arson epidemic, it plunged into a state where gangs and dealers would strive. Most people don't know, but the Bronx was literally burning, and for a period in time it looked more like an Eastern European war zone. This created an atmosphere that would influence the girls and boys that grew up in the years to come, and George was one of those boys. The neighborhood was rough. Food stamps, welfare, dealers, users, and robberies just like any other crime-infested neighborhood. In the mid-1980s, the drug trade was off the charts. East Tremont, Grand Concourse, the 46th Precinct, Soundview Projects are all a part of this story. George grew up struggling with his mother as the head of the household. Things just wasn't right, which forced him to run away on more than one occasion. Around 12 years old, he left and ended up at a house for troubled teens. He would then spend the next few years in other group homes where he was forced to grow up fast and understand the hard truth about the struggles of life. In this time of his development, he acquired the skills and insight on life that he couldn't learn at home with his mother. At some point, he got into some minor trouble with the law and spent a year in a juvenile facility. All this was just training and preparation for what was to come. He then went back to the Bronx where he dropped out of high school for the better things that life had to offer, which included getting to the money. One of his friends, let's call him Mike, was one of the people that put George on to the hustle game. Mike was a hustler and a criminal that was in a mix of things. Mike was the one to give George the name Boy George. It was the kind of name that wasn't thugged out or sounded like a name of a criminal, so it made sense. From that moment, whenever you refer to the name Boy George, it could only mean one of two people either the singer or the teenage hustler. He started hustling for the Torres family that ran a criminal organization. They were a big organization that had been operating since the 1970s, distributing H in the Bronx and Manhattan. They used that money to purchase properties and open up a $30 million mall in Puerto Rico and fund other criminal activities. At the time when Dougie Fresh was doing his thing, George was 17 years old and was a full-blown hustler. He was hustling on the blocks of the South Bronx and in the dirty hallways of those brick buildings. Since he started making money, he recruited the friends he knew from his juvenile facility days. He was doing well and making good money for the Torres organization. George was getting to the money. To keep everything in perspective, you have to remember this was in the 1980s and he was buying houses in Puerto Rico for $400,000 cash. Just think about what you was doing in high school and what he was doing in high school. Exactly. He was driving the newest Benz that just came out that same year. In June 1987, when he was 19 years old, back in Puerto Rico, the DEA arrested key members of the Torres organization that employed him. Back in New York, more than 40 members of the organization was arrested, and this created a vacuum and an opening for a change of leadership. George was ready for that change, so he made his move. Little did he know, if he was able to predict the future, he would have known that in the next two years, the same thing that happened to the Torres organization would happen to him. By using the connections he made while working for the Torres family, 
he recruited friends from Castle Hill and other parts of the Bronx he was familiar with. He then started a takeover. That was accomplished by violence. So money started coming in, and he was well on his way to being a teenage boss. He opened up a few spots in the city, and to keep his people happy, he paid them what they was worth. Putting his team together, George recruited a hustler named Ward Johnson, known as Six O. Six O was a dollar cab driver that had a pre-existing relationship with George. Six O was one of those people that knew his way around town. He knew where to get things, and if he couldn't get it, he knew who to talk to. Over time, he became George's second in command, his right hand man, who would go on to help George to become the number one source of H in the Bronx. Months later, sometime around August 1987, law enforcement learned about George's operation from a guy he trusted, Mike. Mike turned out to be a confidential informant who introduced George as Boy George to an undercover detective that was posing as a hustler who needed to re-up. In October, Mike and the undercover officer met with George again at a restaurant and with a full belly, the undercover officer bought some more H. Sixo informed George that dude he just did business with could be a cop, so George listened to his right-hand man and never did business with him again. In the 80s in New York, H was partially supplied by the Chinese gangs. One of those suppliers belonged to a gang named the Flying Dragons. George leveled up. He started making real money, grossing over $200,000 a week. The biggest problem at this level is figuring out a way to clean all that dirty money. So he hired financial consultants that made investments to diversify his money in order to make it look legal. To get attention from girls and federal agents, they drove around in Ferraris, BMWs, and Porsches. He had about 20 cars, which included a $350,000 Porsche with a telephone. VCR, television with ostrich skin interiors. George did a deal with two associates that was worth half a million dollars. Associate number two disappeared with the cash and left George looking like a fool. A few hours later, it's alleged that George unloaded on associate number one. He didn't make it. A hitman from the organization then went to look for associate number two. Around that time, the government installed listening devices on George's phones. It turned out that 60 recorded conversations would later be introduced into evidence and used against him in the court of law. These conversations provided details of the ongoing conspiracy and proved George was the boss. Law enforcement would arrest a few of his workers and turn just about all of them into snitches and informants. They would give up information such as locations of the cutting mills where bricks of H were broken down and bagged up. In May 1988, a month after the loss of a half a million, associate number two became a victim. He didn't make it. The hitman found him and made him pay for what he did to the boss. A month later, in a parking lot of a seafood restaurant on City Island, a man named Todd would become the next victim of the 18-year-old hitman. A few days later, on June 27th, Tyson would only need 91 seconds to wipe the floor with Michael Spinks. Months after that, at the end of the year, it's alleged that George would send a hitman to take care of a female that stole from the organization. Her name was Miss She didn't make it. The next month, George would make one of his biggest mistakes. On Christmas Eve 1988, he chartered a yacht for $38,000 an hour cash and had a party cruise for his entire organization and his closest associates. While the ship toured New York for three hours, it was an amazing celebration. He paid for everything. Food, drinks, staff, and for entertainment, he hired artists that included Big Daddy Kane and others. The seating arrangements were organized by which crew you was with. While at sea, they had raffles that included $130,000 cash prizes, trips to Disneyland, Mitsubishis, BMWs, and solid gold diamond-encrusted belt buckles. In 88, the party was epic, 
Everyone had a great time and it would be one of those things that would be talked about for years to come. The new year started and he was focused on cleaning his dirty money. He continued to do what the Taurus brothers did. He purchased more property and started new business ventures in Puerto Rico. At 21 years old, George controlled about 15 locations in the Bronx and Manhattan, while law enforcement had three cameras aimed at the location on 243rd Street in the Bronx. They would record members of the organization with suspicious behavior, so they moved in and arrested 11 workers and seized 10 bricks, weapons, ledgers and incriminating information such as names, locations, and the amount of monies that was given and received by who and when. 6O delivered the bad news to George and explained that he needs to get out of town as things are about to hit the fan. The next morning, when George left his apartment, 30 federal agents was outside chilling, waiting for him. George was arrested and taken in for questioning. On their way to the precinct, a federal agent pointed to a small plant and said, See that plant? It's going to be a tree by the time you get out. While he was getting booked, they searched his apartment and found address books with names and numbers, payroll records and transaction information for a full two years. The photo album from the Christmas yacht party helped seal the deal. It showed the faces of all the people that were invited. Not only that, but since everyone was seated in an orderly fashion, it clearly showed which crew each person was associated with. The company that owned the yacht had no choice but to cooperate with the law. They shared all the documents for that night, and law enforcement was able to see who spent all that money and what they spent it on. The simple question is this, if you spent that money, then you have to explain where the money came from. How did you earn that money? While Bismarck Key was dropping hits, in May 1989, 31 people associated with the Boy George Rivera organization was arrested. After seeing all the evidence against him, his right-hand man, 6-0, chose to cooperate, making him the primary witness for the prosecution. This enabled 6-0's son to be free from prosecution for crimes related to this case. The indictment filed in 1990 charged George with running an enterprise from 1987 to 1989. Many people made a decision to cooperate rather than spend years of their lives behind bars. The informant, Mike, would later be found in a trunk of a car in a parking lot. Mike was just one of many on a handwritten hit list written by Boy George himself. Other members of the organization would end up serving a lot of time in prison. Some received 10, 20, and 30-year sentences. It was reported that the feds linked him to six people that didn't make it. And for running a $15 million drug organization in April of 1991 for narcotics conspiracy and tax evasion, Boy George Rivera, at 23 years old, was sentenced to life without parole. He only had a two-year run, but it cost him everything. This was the cautionary tale of the teenage millionaire kingpin, Boy George Rivera. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and click on the next episode from Big City Crime TV.